All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we're gonna to talk about the cerebral cortex primarily focusing on the temporal lobe. We'll also talk a little bit towards the end in more detail about another little mini lobe that's tucked deep inside of the temporal lobe called the insula. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's first off start talking about the temporal lobe. In order for us to really understand the temporal lobe and the outline of it, we have to establish some boundaries of the temporal lobe, right? So there's a couple boundaries. The first one here is this one, this boundary here. This one here is actually called a particular sulcus. It's called the lateral sulcus, right, or the sylvian fissure. And this sulcus beautifully separates the temporal lobe, this lobe here where we have all the colors, from the frontal lobe and from the parietal lobe. So when we talk about the boundaries of the temporal lobe, we have that uh, lateral sulcus or the sylvian fissure, right? That lateral sulcus or the sylvian fissure, what does that do? Well, that separates again the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe and from the parietal lobe. There's another one. Now this one isn't actually a defined sulcus. There's a little notch right here. A little notch, you see how kind of after the occipital lobe you get like this little notch before you go into the temporal lobe? This notch is called the preoccipital notch. And what happens is, is if you draw this notch, an imaginary line, kind of like from that preoccipital notch at an angle towards the tip of the lateral sulcus, it beautifully separates the temporal lobe from the occipital lobe. So this imaginary line starting at the preoccipital notch, so again pre occipital notch, this beautifully separates the temporal lobe from the occipital lobe. All right, beautiful, so that's our boundaries. Now we gotta start talking about some of the areas located within the temporal lobe. All right, the first one is this orange area. This orange area here is actually called the primary auditory cortex. Okay, it's called the primary auditory cortex. And you guys can already imagine that the primary auditory cortex is for what? It's for conscious awareness of auditory stimuli. So it's conscious awareness of sound. And we'll get into more detail of that later, but that's the basic uh, explanation of the primary auditory cortex. If you go just a little bit kind of Un underneath that, so just a little bit inferior to the primary auditory cortex. You have this next blue area. This blue area is called the auditory association cortex, okay? It's called the auditory association cortex. Now remember, pretty much every primary cortex has an association cortex associated with it, right? Because the sensation or motor function of that primary cortex has to ha interact with those association cortex to give meaning, purpose, understanding, recognition. So the auditory association cortex, basically, it gives meaning to the sounds. And we'll, again, we'll explain more of what that means, but it gives meaning or understanding of sounds. All right, so this next area, this green structure, this green shaded in area, this is called Wernicke's area. Now, Wernicke's area is very interesting. Wernicke's area is very interesting because it's involved with the comprehension. So it's Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is involved with the comprehension and understanding of written and spoken language, okay? So it, it's involved with the comprehension of written and spoken language. So trying to understand what you are hearing or what you are reading, okay? So that's the significance of Wernicke's area. All right, there's another area. Now this one is actually gonna be difficult to see. We'll show you a little bit later in another view, but I kind of made like a dotted line here. You can't see it. It's not on the outer lateral surface of the brain it's tucked deep on the medial surface of the brain. But just for right now, I want you to imagine that if you guys were looking through here, this dotted line with the pink lines here, if you look deep in there on the medial surface of the brain, you have this pink structure here. 
and that is called the primary olfactory cortex. And there's also, if you see here in red, there's also another association cortex associated with it. So again, the pink and red structure there, which is going to be found deep on the medial surface of the brain in the temporal lobe is called the primary olfactory cortex. And again, in that red area there, you're also going to have its association cortex and the association cortex. So again, this would be your olfactory association cortex. What is the job of this primary olfactory cortex? Well, the job of the primary olfactory cortex is to help us to become consciously aware of particular smells. So it's conscious awareness of smell. But then what your auto, your uh, primary, your olfactory association cortex does is, is it takes those smells and it analyzes the smell. Okay, and it helps us to recognize maybe smell patterns. And another important thing of this area, this association cortex, is it can communicate with our limbic system. So not only can it analyze the smell, help us to recognize what kind of smell it is, but it can connect it with our emotional system to help us to see, oh, this was actually a smell that brings back good memories, bad memories, oh, this is not a good thing, right? So again, that's the significance of the primary olfactory and association cortex. The last one here, it's very difficult to see. The best way to kind of see this one is you have to take a coronal section of the brain. And if you take a coronal section of the brain, you get something like this. Here's your, let's say this is your parietal lobe. And then here are these little things here on the side of your temporal lobes, and then you go into your midbrain. Deep, deep in the temporal lobe. So here's your temporal lobe that I'm shading here, right? This is your temporal lobe. This up here is your parietal lobe. Deep within that temporal lobe, you have like a little kind of gyrus here, a little area, a little lobe there called the insula, okay? So that's called the insula, okay? The insular cortex, if you really want to be specific. Now, the insular cortex has a couple functions. Two functions that we definitely have kind of some understanding of is that this insular cortex receives information about taste. So it receives information about gustation. The other thing that we have some concept, uh, conception of with the insular cortex is that it's also responsible for receiving visceral sensations. So visceral sensations, okay? And the last thing that it's interesting, we're trying to look into it more, again, it's not completely well understood, but they see that vestibular information, so equilibrium, your dynamic and static equilibrium sense, can also go to your insular cortex. So this may also be where the vestibular sensations or your vestibular cortex resides. So this can also be where vestibular sensations go. All right, that covers the basic uh, areas and the basic boundaries of the temporal lobe. Let's go ahead and talk first about the primary auditory cortex. All right, so let's start with the primary auditory cortex. What do we say was the basic function of this area? Conscious awareness of sound. Well, really, if we were to be more specific, it helps us to identify three particular things about sound. So when we talk about sound itself, sound waves that are produced, right? We can actually, our primary auditory cortex can help us to understand basically the frequency of sound, right? So the frequency of sound. It also is in good for, it's good for interpreting uh, particularly the pitch of sound. So it's also important for determining the pitch of sound. And last but not least, it can also help with localization of sound. What does that mean? Determining the location of where the sound is coming from. The right side, the left side, somewhere in the middle. So it's also good for localizing sound. So I would say that these are the three main things when it comes to how the primary auditory cortex becomes consciously aware of sound stimulus. It helps us to determine the frequency of sound, pitch of sound, localizing sound. Now, how does that actually work? Well, we've already talked about the auditory pathway in great detail, um, and, and again, in our neurology playlist for the vestibulocochlear nerve. 
But from the inner ear, the cochlea, you have particular sensations, right? The, based upon the sound waves, activate the spiral organ of corti and then activate this vestibulocochlear nerve. Cranial nerve, which one? This is cranial nerve eight. So cranial nerve eight, which is your vestibulocochlear nerve, will move in to your medulla. And again, we're not gonna focus too much here on the, the details of it. I only want you to know one thing, that this vestibulocochlear nerve, its synapses on cochlear nuclei located in your medulla. Then what happens is, these nuclei will then cross via what's structure called the trapezoid body, doesn't really matter right now, I only want you to get this one particular point out of this. That as this crosses, it eventually will come up and then synapse on some particular nuclei located here in the thalamus, okay? Again, if you guys remember from the thalamus, music, medial, so really the nucleus here is the medial geniculate nucleus. We don't really care about that, but here's what I want you to, to know. That if you follow this, let's say that we have stimulus coming from, in this case, the left ear. And then we have stimulus via the vestibular cochlear nerve coming from the right ear. If we follow the stimulus going from the left ear, where is it going? Well, it's already crossed at the medulla, gone upwards, synapsed on the right thalamus. And then from the right thalamus, it's going to go to the right primary auditory cortex. Now, here's something to remember. Along the way, there is some crosstalk between these two pathways, but for the most part, the sound uh, waves, the sound stimulus, via the frequency, pitch, and localizing, uh, localization of sound, mostly goes to the contralateral primary auditory cortex. So that's what I want you guys to remember. So how sound waves are actually causing this primary auditory cortex to basically focus on the frequency, focus on the pitch and the localizing is via this vestibulocochlear nerve. And the big thing I really want you to remember because it's important clinically is that this information usually crosses. And then after it crosses at the cochlear nuclei, it goes to the contralateral primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. Why is that important? Well, let's say that you, for some reason you develop damage to anything above your cochlear nuclei. Here's your cochlear nuclei. You develop damage anything above that area, okay? So let's just say for right now, we'll focus here on damage of this actual, either this auditory pathway or the right primary auditory cortex that you're gonna damage. If you follow this back, if you damage the right primary auditory cortex, where is most of those sensations coming from? Which side of the ear? The left ear. So because of that, a lesion of the, of the primary auditory cortex, in this case, we're using the example, a lesion of the right primary auditory cortex might cause us to develop Difficulty being able to determine the location and somewhat degree of pitch and frequency of sound coming from the contralateral side. So right primary auditory cortex lesion can result in contralateral loss of sound stimulus, particularly what? the ability to localize the sound, pitch of the sound, frequency of the sound. That is why this is important, okay? So that covers our primary auditory cortex. Let's move on to auditory association cortex. All right, auditory association cortex. Let's have a little bit of fun, okay? This, is, this area is actually very interesting. So the audit primary auditory cortex is relatively simple, right? We, we already kind of explained this process that if you have some type of sound, right, that sound is going to, in some way, shape, or form, stimulate the cochlea, right? Which will activate the vestibulocochlear nerve. And from the vestibulocochlear nerve, right? If we were to just kind of put here cranial nerve, which one? Eight. From this, it goes up, you know, hits the cochlear nuclei, crosses over, and eventually goes to the contralateral, what? Contralateral uh, primary auditory cortex, which we drew here in orange. Okay, so that's where the sound stimulus is going. And again, what is this determining? It's determining the pitch, the location, and the frequency of the sound.
Now, from that, from this primary auditory cortex, it then tells the next cortex that we're focusing on here, the auditory association cortex, hey, here's the sound stimulus, here's the pitch, here's the frequency, here's the location or the localization of the sound. Now what I want you to do is go ahead and analyze that, try to come up with, uh, basically compare that with past memories of these sounds, and then tell me what is the meaning of this sound stimulus. What do I mean? If I were to kind of explain this in a couple ways, we're gonna give you an example, I think that's the best way of understanding it. But if you have a sound stimulus, right, based upon what uh, things we talked about, the, the frequency of the sound, the pitch of the sound, and the location of the sound. Whenever this hits the primary auditory cortex and then tells the association cortex, it might take, based upon the frequency, pitch, location, comparing it with past memories, it might take that sound as a couple different things. It could be a scream. It could be the sound of music. It could be the sound of thunder. So there's a lot of things that can be interpreted based upon the frequency, pitch, and location of sound. What's the best example of this? A wife and a husband. You have a wife, right? You got, you're coming and you're saying, hey, babe, how are you doing today? And she can say, I'm fine, right? But you know whenever somebody says, I'm fine, they can say it a couple different ways, right? What are the different ways that they could say it? Well, they could say it maybe like this. I'm fine. Which she's like, oh, okay, she's actually, she's okay. Or it's like, oh, I'm fine. And you're like, oh, is she actually fine or is she not fine? And then it's like, I'm fine. And you're like, oh, she pissed, right? So you can determine in some way, shape, or form what the, that sound, all those sound stimulus, all that thing that's coming out of her mouth, which again is based upon the frequency, the pitch, the location, all of that goes to the primary auditory cortex, then to the auditory association cortex. We utilize that, analyze the sound, help us to compare with past memories, and then come up with an interpretation of that sound. So again, how does that work? You take this thing, I'm fine sound, right? And again, based upon what things? based upon the pitch, based upon the frequency, based upon even the amplitude, based upon the location, all of these things can be analyzed, right? So you're gonna analyze all of this. And the next thing that you're gonna also do is you're gonna compare this with past memories, right? So you're gonna dig into past memories of these sounds previously. So you're going to actually compare with past memories. And then what you're going to do is, is after you analyze this, compare with past memories, then you're going to use this to come up with recognizing the purpose or meaning of that sound stimulus. And again, that could be interpreted in three ways, right? I'm fine could be, I'm actually fine, based upon the pitch, the frequency, amplitude of the way she says it. Or it could be, she's not fine. All right, so that pretty much tells us how the auditory association cortex works and how it gives us the purpose, meaning, understanding of sound stimulus. Now let's move on to Wernicke's area. All right, so Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is actually a really interesting area, really cool area. So where is it? Uh, again, we kind of said that we already talked about here was our primary auditory cortex. And then if you guys remember, what was just kind of inferior to that was our auditory association cortex. Now we have a couple other cortexes that we're gonna point out here. This one right here in purple is actually going to be the, the visual cortex areas, right? So we're just gonna assume that this is the visual primary and association uh, cortexes. Now, right here, which we kind of drew in green, like right here, this was our, what? Wernicke's area, right? Now, Wernicke's area is important because it said it's involved in what? It's involved with the comprehension and understanding of written and spoken language. So, how does that actually work? How does it do that? Well, Wernicke's area receives stimulus from two areas. Remember we said here was our visual area, right? So this is where we have visual stimuli. 
And then over here is going to be our, both of these, is our auditory area. What happens is any kind of auditory stimulus will go to this area, right? And any type of visual stimulus will go to this area. After these areas are stimulated from the visual auditory stimulus, they analyze it, they recognize it, then what they do is, is they send that information to Wernicke's area. And then Wernicke's area is gonna have both a understanding of visual input and understanding of auditory input. And then it's gonna process all that information and try to provide a complete understanding and comprehension of both the combination of visual and auditory stimulus. Now, what it does then is it communicates to another structure located here in the frontal lobe. It sends signals to this structure here in the frontal lobe via a structure called the arcuate fasciculus. And this structure here located in the frontal lobe is called Broca's area. So this is called Broca's area. And what Broca's area is involved in is it's involved in speech production. So it's involved in speech production. So let me kind of give you an example as the best way to kind of understand how Wernicke's area receives visual auditory cues, comes up with a comprehension of that, and develops an information uh, from that to send to the Broca's area to develop a, a vocal response. I think this is a good example. Again, you got another wife, then you got a husband. Isn't this always the truth? Wife's talking, and you don't hear anything she said, okay? But let's pretend at this point in time, you were listening to her. So she asked you, were you listening to me? Now, from this, that were you listening, what's that gonna do? That's gonna be the auditory aspect. So that auditory aspect is going to be hitting the ear, those sound waves, the way that she says it, right? So again, dependent upon the pitch, the frequency, the amplitude, the location, the pit, the, the tone of it. All of that will be taken to your ear, and then from the inner ear taken to your auditory cortex, where you'll interpret that what she's trying to get across, this whole uh, meaning, understanding of her spoken language. Then you also have to visualize her facial expressions, okay? So her facial expressions of how she might be saying, were you listening to me, is going to have to hit that eyeball. And then from the eye, it's going to have to send that information to your visual cortex. The visual cortex is going to have to take all of the social cues, all her facial expressions, compare it with past memories, and then from there, come up with a complete analysis and understanding of her facial expressions. Then from that, the visual area and the auditory area are going to send that information to the Wernicke's area. So now, how does the Wernicke's area function in this sense? Well, let's say she asks you, were you listening? And you look at her facial cues and she looks, she looked mad, all right? Because it didn't look like you were listening. But some of the auditory stimulus was getting there to your ears. Maybe you just had some selective attention. You have to read her social cues, but also realize that all you heard was just And you have to do, do what? Comprehend that, oh shoot, I don't remember anything that she said to me. I'm in big trouble, what do I say? Well, after you've comprehended that, you're going to send that information via the arcuate fasciculus to the Broca's area, and then you're going to develop a response for that, right? So were you listening? Yeah, I was, I was listening to you. I heard everything you said. That is how the Wernicke's area is involved in this process, okay? So again, all right, so let's kind of write this out and again, kind of give you the whole package putting all of this together. So when the wife says to the husband, were you listening? Again, how does Wernicke's area work? It basically takes that sound stimulus. All right, so here's your sound stimulus. And the way she says it, right? So again, based upon the pitch, based upon the tone, based upon the frequency, based upon the amplitude, based upon the location, all of these things are gonna have to get sent to your what? Auditory cortex, okay? And then from there, the auditory cortex will then send that what? to the association cortex to basically come up with an understanding, comprehension, and basically meaning behind what she's saying. Then at the same time, you're gonna have the visual cues. So you're also going to have to be looking at her facial expressions, right? So then that's going to be the visual stimulus. 
And that visual stimulus will have to get sent and you're gonna to have to look at, again, all of her facial cues, right? Facial expressions, okay? <laughs> all of these things are gonna have to sent to the visual cortex. And then from your visual cortex, you're going to have to develop a complete kind of understanding, meaning behind her facial expressions and facial cues. And then both of these areas are going to synapse on Wernicke's area. And now Wernicke's area is going to help us to comprehend both the uh, kind of the language aspect, whether it be nonverbal via facial cues and verbal via the sound stimulus, and come up with a response by sending it to who? Broca's area. And then Broca's area will help us to do what? Come up with speech production via the arcuate fasciculus. So that's kind of how this is all working. Why, is all, why am I spending so much time explaining all this? There's a condition called Wernicke's aphasia where you have damage of this Wernicke's area. Why is that important and how can they present? Let's talk about that. All right, so Wernicke's aphasia, right? Here's the big thing I want you guys to remember. Wernicke's aphasia, there's damage of the Wernicke's area usually as a result of a stroke, right? Usually kind of like a middle cerebral artery stroke. But regardless, in Wernicke's aphasia, what happens with them? Well. The problem with Wernicke's area is that it's where basically comprehension is occurring. And remember, if you think about Wernicke's area here, if it is damaged, right, is Broca's area, is that affected in any way, shape, or form? No, Broca's area isn't really affected, and Broca's area is where speech production is occurring. So the patient will be able to speak, and they'll be able to speak rather fluently because you're not damaging the, the muscles of speech production. So they'll have fluent speech. But here's the problem, because they can't comprehend anything that they're uh, visually or auditorily being stimulated from, the speech that they have is completely nonsensical. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's kind of like just a word salad, okay? So not only is their speech fluent and nonsensical, which, you know, again, they don't make any sense when they're saying things, but their comprehension is no longer intact. So comprehension is not intact. So let's say that a patient recovers from Wernicke's aphasia. They'll actually tell you that, yeah, when you were saying things to me and you were talking to me, I couldn't understand anything that you were trying to tell me. So that's kind of what it means that their comprehension is not intact. Now, Another term for Wernicke's aphasia is because they're having a problem with processing information. This is called receptive aphasia. This is called receptive aphasia. So that's why I wanted us to make sure that we understand uh, Wernicke's area and, and then respectively Wernicke's aphasia. All right, the next area that we have to talk about is that primary olfactory cortex and then the association cortex. Again, you couldn't see it from the lateral view, but you can see it here from this medial view. Now, when you look here, you have, uh, again, frontal lobe here, and then again, here's gonna be parietal lobe, and then back here is occipital lobe, and then right here is temporal lobe, right? So I said, tucked into the temporal lobe, you have this primary olfactory cortex. Where would it be? Well, it would be right here towards the medial aspect of the temporal lobe called the uncus. So right here is going to be the primary olfactory cortex. And then just kind of right, kind of underneath it here is going to be the association cortex for the olfactory system. Now, this is actually a very interesting uh, structure. Now we talked about how the primary olfactory cortex is involved with conscious awareness of smells. Now, if we take, for example, how this actually does this, we're gonna have a big old pile of dookie here. That pile of dookie is obviously gonna give off some particular odorants. And what happens is those odorants do what? Well, they activate particular olfactory receptors, and then once they activate those olfactory receptors, that stimulates what? Olfactory nerves, which are present within your nasal cavity. Those olfactory nerves move where? They move up through the cribriform plate in the ethmoid bone, and then to a structure here sitting on the bottom of the frontal lobe here called the, what is this structure here called? 
your olfactory bulb. So what happens is from this smell, okay, the doo-doo particles, <laughs> this is actually going to do what? It's going to eventually activate, right, the olfactory receptors, come up via the olfactory nerves, and then eventually synapse and stimulate this olfactory bulb. Once you activate the neurons present within the olfactory bulb, this is going to move down through the olfactory tract, right? And then the olfactory tract will then move into what's called striae. We're not going to go into crazy detail here. But again, you have olfactory bulb, olfactory tract, and then you have these things called striae. This is actually called your medial olfactory striae, and this is your lateral olfactory striae. Again, I don't want us to really focus on this. I want us to really get this whole point here is that from you have this, this smell stimulus, activates the olfactory bulb, then travels down the olfactory tract, and then from here it can go via these little radiations into two areas in the brain. Okay, One of these areas is going to be something that we're not really going to focus on here. A little bit of smell stimulus can go to an area in your frontal lobe. We're just going to mention it here so that you guys know it. It's going to be here in the frontal lobe. This area here is called the orbito frontal cortex, okay? And we're going to leave it at that. I want us to primarily focus on the primary olfactory cortex. So smell stimulus will come via the olfactory bulb, olfactory tract, lateral olfactory striae to a particular area in the temporal lobe called the primary olfactory cortex. So what is this area here? Primary olfactory cortex. Now what does the primary olfactory cortex do? Well, it basically helps us to develop a conscious awareness of that smell. So it gives us basically awareness of the smell. Then what we're going to do is, based upon the awareness of the different types of smells, so if we follow the stimulus, you hit that olfactory bulb, go down the olfactory tract, follow that medial olfactory striae through the primary olfactory cortex, and then now we're going to go into that olfactory association cortex. So if we follow that smell signal, right? So we're, we're made aware of the smell. Then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna take that sense, that awareness of smell, and send it to the olfactory association cortex. So this is going to be the association cortex. Now here's what's cool about this association cortex. It can take the smell, and do something with it. What, one of the things it can do with the smell is it can actually store that smell sense into memory, right? Into memory so that if we're ever exposed to that again, we know what that smell is. You know, dookie in this case. The other thing it can do is it can take that smell and analyze it, right? Take all the different types of odorants, all the different odorant materials that are coming from it, after it analyzes it and compares it with a past memory of that smell, it helps us to recognize what that smell is, right? So we can obviously tell the difference between certain types of smells. Then once we've recognized this smell, it helps us to, again, do what? Identify what that smell is. And that's important because if you can't identify some type of smell sense, there may be some degree of what's called anosmia, which is lack of smell. So that's an important thing. Here's the other really interesting aspect of the association cortex. The other thing it can do is, is the, the olfactory association cortex can send that smell stimulus, all that smell information, to your limbic system. There's a couple different structures involved in your limbic system. But one that really gets a lot of this stimulus is your amygdala, right? And your amygdala is involved with the emotional aspect, right, of things. So anger, aggression, anxiety, different things like that. And so what this smell will do is if it goes through the limbic system, you're going to tie emotions now to the smell stimulus. So... If I'm walking outside, I got two French Bulldogs, I'm walking outside and I step in a poop, right? And then I go inside and I track it all over my house and then I smell something. I'm like, what the, what the frick is that? And I, I look down at my shoe and I see a big old pile of dookie on there. 
I'm obviously going to know the smell based upon the familiarity of it with my dogs. And then I'm also going to remember, oh, I tracked it all through my house. I'm going to be mad. So because of that, smell can have this involvement, right, of where it can be linked with emotions. And we help this association cortex can actually, it's so cool because it can store our smell memory and then help us to analyze it and recognize what that smell is. So that's how our primary olfactory and olfactory association cortex work. All right. So the insula, the insula is very interesting. And again, we actually consider this, this is important to remember. It's not actually a part of the temporal lobe. It's actually kind of its own little area of the cerebral cortex. So technically we consider four lobes of the cerebral cortex, right? Classically, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal. Well, a lot of the times we consider insula the fifth mini lobe of the cerebral cortex. Now, where is the insula? So this area right here is going to be your parietal lobe, right? We'll just say that we're taking a section through the parietal lobe. And then over here, so same thing, parietal lobe, this right area right here is going to be your temporal lobe. Right, so deep within the temporal lobe, you have this kind of separate area from it, which is called your insula. Now your insula is really cool because we said it's involved in receiving, it has three primary functions. One of it is it receives visceral sensations. So visceral sensations, so maybe pain, temperature sensations, maybe just some type of sensation from what areas? Visceral sensations from the heart, visceral sensations from the lungs, and visceral sensations from your, maybe your gastrointestinal tract. If any of these signals are coming up here, right? Let's just combine all of these. Sensations from the lungs and then sensations from the heart here. This is all visceral sensations. Where can they go? They can go to your insula. Why is this important? Why is having visceral sensations going to this area important? If any of you guys have ever had gastroenteritis, right, so maybe some type of food poisoning, you had some definite irritation of your GIT or your viscera, that pain information coming from your GIT due to the, GIT from the, uh, due to the gastroenteritis will send that information to your insula. And then your insula takes that visceral sensation and helps you to remember it for the next time you decide to go and eat maybe somebody's potato salad that's been baking out in the sun all day. And you're like, oh, never mind, I'm not gonna eat that. I remember what happened the last time I did that. So again, the visceral sensations going to the insula is important for helping us to realize those sensations and maybe helping us to prevent us from making those same decisions that caused that in the first place. The other function of the insula is we said that it might have some type of involvement with vestibular sensations, right? So from your inner ear, right, you have your vestibule and your semicircular canals, and that is involved with your equilibrium, right? Your equilibrium sensations. What type of equilibrium? Well, your static equilibrium and your dynamic equilibrium. Obviously dynamic via the semicircular canals, static via the vestibule. But either way, information from this area, from your uh, inner ear, will then go where? To your insula. It'll also go to your insula. Now, obviously, these vestibular sensations can go to a bunch of different areas, right? They can go to vestibular nuclei located within your medulla. And then from here, they can go where? They can go to your uh, cerebellum. They can go down to your actual vestibular spinal tract. But one of the things that can happen is, is that it can go to this insula and help you to have, again, a, a sense of awareness of your equilibrium to some degree. All right. The last thing that the insula is actually responsible for is taste sensations. So what do I mean? So obviously when you think about taste, there's different types of taste, right? And this is how the insula helps in this process. It helps us to maybe differentiate the types of taste. So what are the different types of taste? Well, you guys know that there is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and then the newer one is ooh, umami, right, due to protein-rich foods and glutamate. But either way, all of these different types of um, tastes are dependent upon what foods we eat, right? 
but all of these different types of taste stimuli will activate particular types of taste buds, you know, your gustatory receptors present on your tongue. And then from your tongue, you have nerves, right? Obviously, you have the different cranial nerves that'll take that information up to an area in your brainstem called the nucleus of tractus solitarius. So all this information will be carried up via cranial nerves from these different areas of the tongue. It'll be carried up and then eventually we'll go to an area here. If you guys really want to write it down, it's called the nucleus of tractus solitarius. But what will happen here? This taste stimulus will then go to the insula so that we can be consciously aware of the different types of taste that we're actually having within our food. Oh, is this a sweet food, a salty food, a sour, a bitter, or an umami taste? So that's how the insula functions in visceral sensation awareness, equilibrium, and the taste. All right, engineers, so in this video, we talk about the temporal lobe and the insula of the cerebral cortex. I hope all of it made sense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram. Go follow us, as well as we'll have links to our Patreon. If you guys want to go donate there, we would truly appreciate it. All right, engineers, thank you, love you, and as always, till next time.